We're learning more about a frontline volunteer from the GTA who was killed in Ukraine. He was always willing to work and do everything he possibly could to help people in need. How volunteer organizations and colleagues are remembering Anthony Tonko. Plus, Moroccan people are, um, uh, what are they are going through uh, back home, that it's um, earthquake, it's a hard time. Hopefully with the, all these donations, we can, uh, we can get them what they need. As the death toll continues to rise after a powerful earthquake in Morocco, the local community is mobilizing to raise funds and send aid. And... I'm forced to move. I'll likely have to leave Toronto if that happens, so there's quite a bit of stress about that. Uncertainty continues for the artists who live and work in buildings owned by Artscape Toronto after the organization had its receivership delayed by at least 30 days. This is CBC Late Night News. A Canadian has been killed by a Russian attack on the front lines of the war in Ukraine. He volunteered for aid groups, helping rescue those in harm's way. Jamie Strachan has more on the man colleagues describe as truly selfless. Anthony Ianat went to Ukraine to help, leaving behind his home in the Toronto area. It cost him his life. He was just a joy to be around. Uh, he was always happy. He was always willing to work and do everything he possibly could to help people in need. Always laughing and just uh, an, an, incredible, an incredible person. Last year, the 58-year-old handyman, known to friends as Tonko, sold his truck and traveled to the war-ravaged country, driven by the despair he saw on TV. He worked with a variety of NGOs, the latest Road to Relief, an organization providing medical aid and evacuation. In a post, the NGO said he died Saturday in the Donetsk region. A Spanish citizen was also killed. They were driving near the city of Bakhmut when their vehicle was struck by Russian shells. While not naming Ianat, Global Affairs Canada confirmed the death of a Canadian citizen in Ukraine. To know that he died, um, that he was killed trying to evacuate civilians, trying to help other people is, um, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an incredible thing to do, um, incredible, incredible way to to use you know, your time on this earth to, to help other people. Ianat had been in Ukraine working non-stop for the last 18 months, remembered as someone who would do anything he could to help. He had such, a, such an impact on me. He came out and he was our ambulance driver and uh, he'd, uh, he'd never driven an ambulance before, but he, uh, he, was, so, he was up for anything and he was just a great guy. At this point, there's no indication Ianat's vehicle was targeted. The real question on how to respond to this comes down to an assessment as to whether the Russians were deliberately targeting uh, this convoy, these humanitarian workers. Tanko Ianot, a man driven to make life better for others in this brutal conflict, is now another casualty of this war. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. To Morocco now, where more than 2,100 people are confirmed dead after an earthquake. And that number is expected to rise even more. Officials say how many are rescued depends largely on the next two to three days. Chris Brown reports. The drive out of Marrakesh up into the Atlas Mountains is windy and boulders still litter the highway. But at least now most debris is cleared and a path for rescuers is open. Time is running out though. Moulay Brahim, a town of 5,000 people, is near the epicenter. At least 25 people were killed here in their homes Friday night. Others may still be alive under the bricks and rock. We met Mosin, whose mother was home by herself when the shaking caved in her home. He hopes miraculously maybe she's alive. She couldn't run away, he said, because she's too old. In the building next to hers, there could be two or three more people buried. Residents said they could hear screams coming from inside the next day. Many of the buildings in Moulay Brahim are simply built of rock stuck together with dried mud. We're perched here on the side of a mountain, so when that earthquake hit, many of them just crumbled. Hardly any homes here now are fit to live in. Rashida told us, we just sleep outside, me and my two kids. We have nowhere else to go. 
Survivors seemed shell-shocked. Ahmed Bolal carefully took us into his shattered home. It's been in his family for generations. He, along with a brother and a sister who now lives in Moncton, was raised here. I have tears in my eyes. This is where my father grew up. The whole village is like this, he said. There have been rescues here, but the funerals have also begun. With so many smaller villages in these mountains only getting access now, and with the damage possibly far worse in Amoule Ibrahim, the worry is the number of dead will climb much higher. Morocco's government has started setting up relief centres with tents and food for those who've lost everything and with loved ones missing. The immensity of what's been taken from them is too much to comprehend. Chris Brown, CBC News, in Moulay Ibrahim, Morocco. Meanwhile, here at home, the local community is coming together to help. From family restaurants to humanitarian organizations, they're mobilizing to raise funds and send aid to Morocco. Patrick Swadden has more on those efforts tonight. Mona Ahmed's sister and her family live in Morocco. And while they survived the devastating earthquake that's claimed over 2,000 lives, they're living in the streets. So they're scared, frightened. And you can hear in the background the mothers calling for their kids, and, and some of them are lost. They didn't find their kids yet. And that's why Ahmed's family owned Mississauga restaurant is donating all its weekend sales to help victims of the earthquake. Since yesterday, so many phone calls, so many people showed up just to give donation without even ordering. Some ordered takeout just to help out. As Ahmed says, the restaurant's been packed since they made the announcement. It's actually very comforting to know that there's a community here that cares about people back home. They don't know yet how much money was raised, but... Whatever number it's going to help. And it's not the only way the GTA has rallied for the African nation. In Scarborough, the Moroccan Association of Toronto threw open its doors for anyone to donate. Almost all of us still have families back home. Me, for me, my whole family is still there. Association President Nargis Lazrak says they've raised over $2,000, but will keep online donations open all next week. It's a hard time uh, living on the streets and not having access to clean water. It's very challenging, uh, but hopefully with the, all these donations, we can, uh, we can get them what they need. Things such as? Water and then medication, that's the most important. And over in Etobicoke, that's what Global Medic is doing. We've offered water purification units to go into hospitals and different places where people would seek shelter. As well as thousands of family emergency kits. Singh says the water purification units use gravity to clean dirty water and make it safe to drink. Global Medic is also sending a rapid response team and offering the Moroccan government its drone team. We can tell emergency managers where to fly to, right, and where to get the aid delivered to so they make better decisions. He says it'll also help map out damage to secure global loans. As Morocco recovers from the havoc of Friday's earthquake. Patrick Swadden, CBC News, Toronto. A woman is dead after she was stabbed in the Cabbage Town neighborhood yesterday. Officers were called to the area of Seton Street and Callaghan Lane just after 4.30 p.m. A woman was located with stab wounds. She was transported to hospital where she later died. The investigation is ongoing. To Vaughan now, where York Regional Police are investigating a shooting early this morning. It happened in the area of Highway 7 and Interchange Way shortly after 1 a.m. Officers found evidence of a shooting at the scene but did not find a victim. Police say a person suffering from a gunshot wound had attended a hospital with injuries considered to be non-life-threatening. Investigators are trying to determine if the person is linked to the shooting. No suspect information has been released. Today marks Canadian National Firefighter Memorial Day. With record wildfires burning across the country, this year has even more significance. Hundreds of firefighters and family members from across Canada gathered in Ottawa to honour their fallen colleagues. Four firefighters have been killed battling wildfires in 2023. The fires have caused unprecedented damage in multiple, multiple provinces this season. Sophia Kambali joins us now for a first look at the forecast. Today was nice and breezy, but still warm, so I can't complain about that. 
Yeah, it was pleasant today at home. Uh, some peaks of sunshine as well. We'll take the nice days where we can get them, right? Uh, Sunday overnight into your overnight period, have the windows open, some pleasant sleeping conditions as well. And then we have a bit of a change for Monday, a good change actually. Southerly flow moves in for Monday afternoon, uh, as does just a touch of humidity. Now, I mentioned this, usually not too much to write home to mom about, but I mentioned this because it might be one of the last days where we have a feels like approaching the high 20s for quite some time 23 uh, feeling like 26 in Toronto feeling like 27 in Ottawa and 28 for those of you in Cornwall enjoy the peaks of Sun for the first half of the day Monday the clouds move in for the second half of your Monday and then overnight Monday into Tuesday the start of this next low pressure system comes in with some showers on the Huron and the Georgian shores and then throughout your Tuesday rounds of showers power showers even the odd thunderstorm or two to the tune of 10 to 20 millimeters Talia I'll tell you about the long range the cool down in place after the system thanks Sophia uncertainty continues for the artists who live and work in buildings owned by Artscape Toronto the nonprofit recently announced it would be placed in receivership but last week, Mayor Olivia Chow said the receivership had been delayed by at least 30 days while a working group aims to find solutions. Tyler Chi spoke with residents about some of their concerns. It's quite stressful. I, I admit my mental health has been really suffering. Jessa Aguilo has owned this condo in an artscape building since 2010. It serves as both her home and her multimedia art studio. I've had a hard time focusing uh, on my work because of the uncertainty. Uh, my work can continue because most of it runs out of my house and it's mostly digital now. Uh, but if I'm forced to move, then that's a year of, and I'll likely have to leave Toronto if that happens. So there's quite a bit of stress about that. Artscape was founded in 1986 to address an affordability crisis that was pricing artists out of the city. Earlier this year, the nonprofit's residents learned it was facing financial challenges. They were undergoing a attempt to financially restructure because of some of the debt that they were um, having trouble uh, managing. When that attempt was unsuccessful, Artscape announced it was going into receivership, leaving questions about what would happen to its residents and their homes. I guess it just felt and still feels a little bit like uncharted territory, like the fact that there doesn't seem to be totally a a roadmap or a playbook for what happens next. Mayor Olivia Chow soon responded to the crisis, saying the receivership would be delayed by at least 30 days and that a working group would be formed to help find a solution. Well, we're really hoping that by the end of uh, this month that we've put together a consortium, if you will, of people who can solve their, their biggest financial difficulty and help them to develop a go forward so that they may have a, a, a new organization, a new board. This city councillor says a number of supporters have come forward behind the scenes to respond to Artscape's call for help. 30 days doesn't sound like a lot, but uh, uh, we really think it's possible with the with the people that are working now with Artscape and, and with the city at the table. Meantime, residents say they've been left in the dark about any progress made and say they should also have a voice in the discussion. I hope there's some meaningful consultation with that population of people as we try to figure out what happens next, because uh, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that group. The working group is expected to continue discussions until at least the end of this month. Tyler Chi, CBC News, Toronto. Today is World Suicide Prevention Day, a day to recognize the importance of mental health and taking action to prevent suicides. Distress Centers of Greater Toronto is one of many services that provide help to those who need it. Well, World Suicide Prevention Day is an international way to uh, to do a number of things. One is to recognize uh, the incredible uh, public health issue that suicide is, uh, with over 4,000 people dying by suicide in Canada each year. Uh, it's a way to bring recognition to the plight of those who are vulnerable and at risk. It's also a way to, uh, to bring it uh, to the attention of larger groups such as politicians and those who might be able to provide some financial aid to community groups like ours uh, to continue to do this kind of work, uh, which is to provide support for those who are vulnerable and at risk. Help is available. If you or someone you know is struggling, you can call Talk Suicide Canada at 1-833-456-4566 or text 45645. We'll be right back. The Canadian delegation to the G20 summit, including the Prime Minister, are spending some extra time in India thanks to a mechanical problem on their plane. 
Officials didn't say what the problem was, but they did say it could not be fixed overnight. The delegation found out just as it was heading to the airport. The Prime Minister had been scheduled to be back in Ottawa tomorrow. And it all comes after a weekend of negotiation. G20 countries, including Canada, came up with a new declaration to strengthen cooperation. Evan Dyer reports. Canadian government officials acknowledge that Justin Trudeau's relationship with host Narendra Modi is not good. Modi today pushed Trudeau to rein in six separatists in Canada, and Trudeau says he pushed back on Indian interference in Canada. Referendums held in Brampton and B.C. by a Sikh group banned in India have only made things tenser. Some Canadian business leaders would like to see things improve. But I think when it comes to the sovereignty of a country, we should do everything we can to uh, respect that. Because otherwise you're going to get what you're going to get, which is a very strong pushback. And, um, you know, you, you, you reap what you sow. We better be careful that others don't get involved in our politics either. But Trudeau said he wouldn't compromise on the right of diaspora Canadians to express themselves. He signed the summit declaration, but conceded the language on Ukraine was weaker than he wanted. If it was just up to me, the leader's declaration would have been much stronger. The G20 is a extremely disparate group, uh, and we worked very hard to get uh, as strong language as we possibly could. It wasn't just the language on Ukraine that was weak, but also on climate change. There was no commitment to end subsidies on oil and gas, and no binding targets on emissions. It's certainly the portion of the uh, communique that actually disappoints me most. Uh, we are a couple months away from the next big uh, COP climate change summit and there is nothing new here. What mattered most for India and Modi was that leaders like Joe Biden show up and that they agree to sign a joint communique. So from his point of view, this summit was a success. The content of the communique, however, will be a disappointment for much of the world but it may be the best that can be expected at a time of war and heightened divisions. Evan Dyer, CBC News. It's been a great run for Canada at the Men's Basketball World Cup, and it got even better today. Canada, for the first time ever, the senior men's national team has won a medal at the World Cup. And that color of medal will be bronze. Canada beat the United States by a score of 127 to 118 in overtime. Dylan Brooks led Canada with 39 points. The team also qualified for next year's Paris Olympics. Toronto Raptors TV analyst Leo Routon spoke about the resilience of the Canadian players. I just love their grit. I mean, they have some players, you mentioned Dylan Brooks with 39 points. He was highly criticized this past season in the NBA. A lot of people said, hey, this guy, he can't play. He's got to go to China. And look what he's doing on a global stage. Shea Alexander, you're talking about a player that I think could be an NBA MVP. And then you have a whole bunch of other players around, role players, NBA players, European players, and all of these guys put it together, and they were resilient. They were tough. They battled. So to watch these guys perform, and remember, there are more players. Canada has more players that weren't necessarily available to play this time, so it can only get better uh, to add to this group. It was another busy day at the Toronto International Film Festival. Our senior entertainment reporter Eli Glasner was there and has more from the red carpet of a highly anticipated film. We are back on the red carpet as the Toronto International Film Festival continues for the premiere of the latest film from Taika Waititi. The movie is called Next Goal Wins. Now this is a festival that loves this director. He has won the People's Choice before, but he has talked to the press about being frustrated with the kind of stoic indigenous characters that Hollywood presents. They don't really uh, represent us um, that accurately and you know we never have a sense of humor and like all we do is talk to ghosts and like you know, stand there like breathing in the wind all the time so yeah we do that sure yeah. I don't but uh, you know we're just like everyone else you know like we don't you know walk around in grass skirts we don't like you know kind of like play flutes all day long on you know windswept mountains we have jobs we've got you know day-to-day -day struggles and uh, just the fact is yeah the, the difference is we live in beautiful tropical islands yeah. now certainly if you have a look at the trailer the players on this record-losing soccer team are certainly not stoic. They're just bad 
rad and nerdy and goofy, all the things that Taika is great at capturing. The remarkable thing about this is that it's based on a true story, originally based on a documentary, which inspired Taika Waititi to make this film. We actually spoke with the coach who was hired to turn this losing team around in America, Samoa, and he talked about being a little surprised at how he was cast. He said, you don't know me? My name is Taika Waititi. Yeah. And he actually said, I want my fat bastard friend, Russell Crowe, to play you. You know, Russell is New Zealand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But he's overweight, so he can't yeah. run. So it's going to be Michael Fassbender. So I go, you know what, German. Not Irish, too shabby. Not too shabby, 20 years younger than me. A big Liverpool fan, just like me. So I, I, I can't wait, actually. But everybody here on the red carpet at TIFF says there's only one director that could really do justice to this story. And that is Taika Waititi. Eli Glaster, CBC News, Toronto. Sophia is back now with our extended forecast, and you mentioned some wet weather that we can expect this week. Yeah, let's time it out for you. Enjoy the pleasantries on Monday with some peaks of sun for the first half of the day, and generally a little bit of humidity. Those uh, showers and that low pressure system moves in into the overnight along the Georgian and the Huron shores with some power showers, and then rounds of rain throughout the day, isolated especially in the south, and some sunny breaks but some clearing more towards the dinner hour. Uh, I've got some thunderstorm energy at play as well, so you could get some of those power showers and an isolated rumble of thunder or two. Generally, we're looking at about 10 to 20 millimeters of rain, a little bit more for those of you along the Georgian and, and up towards the north, but a little bit more if you do have a thunderstorm come through your neck of the woods. Now, after this next Tuesday low pressure system, a cool pool of air dips in and behind and it will give us vibes of sort of late September. More of this coming on the way. I have a couple leaves already down in my backyard. It's always a few trees that turn early. Going to be a beautiful color season this year and a great week ahead to head out to the apple patch. Maybe start getting some of that pumpkin and fall decor out. We'll certainly feel like sweater weather midweek after that rainy day. On Tuesday, a good prognosis potentially for next weekend, even though there's a lot at play and that's still a long way out. Until then, plenty of peaks of sunshine and a pretty good week for this mid-September stretch. Uh, remember just a few days ago, we hit the 30s for four days in a row. So enjoy the fall vibes because really we hit uh, a mid-30s mark for the first time this late in the season since 2018. Fall vibes continue with a little bit of humidity again on Monday, 23 feeling like 26 on Monday with that southerly flow and that touch of humidity, Talia. Not a bad looking forecast. Thanks, Sophia. Yeah, we'll take it while we can. And that's our show for you tonight. Thanks so much for watching. You can stay caught up on news anytime on our website, cbcnews.ca. Good night.